Right, well, good morning once again, everyone. I hope your week was good. There's a few smiling faces here. That's nice. <laughs> Thank you so much, worship team. Uh, I can't believe the talent in this church. It's quite amazing. Well, uh, friends, we're in the book of Deuteronomy. You want to find Deuteronomy chapter 16. That's where we're going to be this morning. And you remember that under God, we're trying our best to go through the entire Bible, the whole counsel of God. We're in Deuteronomy, the 16th chapter. And um, I, was thinking, I was thinking as we approach Deuteronomy that I w- this was going to be quick because there's so much review here. And yet the more you read it, the more you realize this is not just bare repetition. There's a reason why there's a fifth book of the Bible. It's not just merely repeating things that have already happened. It's elaborating on some of these things. It's telling them again with new details we didn't see before. And it all comes together and it makes a beautiful, harmonious, rich, deep, wonderful whole. So, uh, can't rush through this. In Deuteronomy 16, we are going to hear about the Passover again. Now, this is appropriate, too, because... We just came out the other side of Easter time. We just came through the Passover season, didn't we? It's still fresh in our minds, and under God, we're going to talk about it again today. And um, so I think what I'll do, I'll just read maybe the first eight verses dealing with the Passover, and then we'll talk about it together, okay? Let's, Let's do that. Chapter 16, verse 1. Moses now speaking. He's God's mouthpiece. Speaking to Israel, and by extension, we get to learn something. Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. Therefore, you shall sacrifice the Passover to the Lord your God from the flock and the herd in the place where the Lord chooses to put his name. And you shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it. That is, the bread of affliction for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. And no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory for seven days, nor shall any of the meat which you sacrifice the first day at twilight remain overnight until morning. You may not sacrifice the Passover within any of your gates, which the Lord your God gives you, But at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide, there you shall sacrifice the Passover at twilight, at the going down of the sun, at the time you came out of Egypt. And you shall roast and eat it in the place which the Lord your God chooses. And in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a sacred assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work in it or no work on it. Well, we're hearing about the Passover again. Most of us are already familiar with the Passover. We've heard this a couple times, haven't we? Beginning in Exodus 12, where God said, okay, uh, Israel, this is going to be the final plague on the Egyptians. This plague will be the one that finally breaks the back of Egyptian domination over you, and you'll be released. You're going to get to go free. There will be an exodus out of Egypt. And you remember that plague. God sent the angel of death to come through and slay the firstborn of every household. And the only way to escape that plague was to kill a lamb, the Passover lamb. It had to be a perfect lamb. You were to to bring this thing into your houses and look it over real good and check it for several days, and if it was perfect and without blemish, then you were to kill that lamb on the prescripted uh, day, the prescribed day, and then you were to eat that lamb, a lamb for a household, and the blood of the lamb was to go on the doorposts and the lentil, the entranceway to the house. And when the angel came through Egypt, if the blood was seen, then the angel would pass over that home. No judgment would come to that home. But people unbelieving who didn't put the blood on their doorposts, well, they would, they would suffer the plague, that there would be a, the death of the firstborn in that home. Uh, and God said, this is to be now an ordinance in Israel. 
that uh, year by year you're to observe the Passover at this time of the year. And we've heard this a couple times. It must be very important. Uh, how many times does God have to tell us something for it to be important? How many times, friends? One time. <laughs> Yet yeah, uh, God likes to tell us the same thing several times. Sometimes he tells you the same thing in different ways. You read the Psalms. A lot of that in the Psalms, isn't, isn't there? And God is very, very interested that we understand that the message he has for you is not garbled or lost. If you don't get, understand it the first way he tells you, he'll tell you again a second way. Maybe he'll use different words this time, but he, the message is the same. And so the Passover must be extremely important. Well, of course, uh, the Passover lamb that's killed and the unleavened bread that's eaten, of course, this speaks of Jesus. We understand this. But, and we sort of take this for granted now. And I don't, I, sometimes I don't think that we realize the supernatural power and brilliance behind all this. I mean, this is, this is all happening and it's being written about 1,400 years before Jesus appears on the scene in the flesh. He's not going to be incarnated for another 1,400 years. And yet, as Jesus lives his life and he's betrayed and he's crucified, uh, everything he's doing and saying and teaching here, uh, you see it all a fulfillment of things that have gone before, including in our minds today we're thinking about the Passover, the Passover ordinance. It speaks of Jesus in breathtaking fashion, I think. And by the time we're done today, you're going to think so too, I think, because we're going to get the words of Paul on this. And Paul is God's man to give us what? An inspired commentary on the Old Testament. So if you're looking at the Passover and you say, you know, I think I see Jesus here in all this, God is going to put his seal of approval on that interpretation because as a matter of fact, the New Testament says so too. So you know you're barking up the right tree. So uh, let's review some of this. Uh, is the Passover speaking of Jesus? Is the unleavened bread speaking of Jesus? Well, we want to say yes, of course, first of all. Uh, the time frame. Look at the time frame when the lamb is killed. It's at, it's at Passover time is the spring of the year. In the Jewish religious calendar, it's the first month. Okay, now when was Jesus crucified? When was he betrayed? mocked, crucified, right at the Passover time. Remember? Uh, the Jewish religious leaders, they said, let's not, I'm paraphrasing, but they said something like this, let's not kill this man at the time of the feast or there, we, we may have a mob on our hands. That was their initial plan. Of course, nothing they wanted to do really worked for them. They, they, wanted, to, they wanted him to stay in the grave. And of course, he wasn't going to listen to ungodly men in that one either. <laughs> No, Jesus was come into the world in the fullness of time. Not a moment too soon or too late. Jesus came into the world. And his crucifixion, resurrection was right according to schedule two. The Jewish religious leader said, let's not do it at the time of Passover. Too bad. In God's uh, timetable, that is exactly when he was going to be crucified. And he was at the time of Passover. Uh, so not just the time, but the type here, there's a shadow and type here to think about. Uh, Deuteronomy 16 doesn't, doesn't uh, give you the, the kind of animal to be slain. Well, we already know that from Exodus 12 and I think it's Leviticus 23. There'll be other places that tell us the Passover animal to be slain is in fact a lamb. Not a goat or something, it's a lamb. You kill a lamb. And, um, well... This lamb is to be without blemish. The lamb is to be examined for five days. And you think of Jesus. He's called the Lamb of God. And wasn't he examined for five days? Didn't he come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey? And the religious leaders were really scrutinizing him. The priestly class, of course. The priests are examining the Passover lamb and the animals that were to be sacrificed in accordance with God's uh, mandates there in the sacrificial system. And the priests were looking at Jesus real carefully, weren't they? And Jesus could say to them, which of you convicts me of sin? Can you spot a blemish in me? And, and what was the answer? Silence. Couldn't find anything wrong with Jesus. In fact, they had to, they had to dredge up some 
false witnesses to testify at his trial. Jesus is that lamb. In fact, he's the promised lamb. He, he was promised at least since the days of Abraham. You remember? Now, you remember Abraham, exit, uh, Genesis 22. Abraham was told that he was to take his only begotten son Isaac up to the top of Mount Moriah, and he was to offer him there as a burnt offering. His only, be his only begotten son, his beloved son, the son of promise, his unique son. And so there was Abraham and Isaac, and Isaac was under the sentence of death three days because it was on the third day that Abraham was to slay that child. And uh, the child knew, Isaac knew that they were heading up the mountain to, to make an offering. And he said, Dad, here's the fire, and here's, here's the wood, here's the knife. Where's the lamb? Where's the animal? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. And we know, in retrospect, he's thinking of God's son, Jesus, the most beautiful human being to ever touch the planet. He sanctified the planet with his feet. And of course, God didn't allow Abraham to kill his son, and God provided a ram, a ram with his horns caught in the thicket. But you see, the promise of a lamb was still standing at that time, 2,000 years before Jesus came into the world. The, Abraham said, I'm calling this place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And the writer says, Moses says, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it will be seen. We will see the, that lamb on the mount of the Lord. And all of Israel saw the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, on that mount, hanging on a cross. The Lamb of God provided. John understood it. John the Baptist, that, that strange man, John the Baptist, out there in the wilderness, baptizing people in the Jordan. He said, there comes one after me who is preferred before me. He was before me, whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and, and tie up. I, I'm not worthy. And one day, that lamb, Jesus, came walking over the hill, and John directed his followers to him. He said, there he is, the lamb of God who bears away the sin of the world. And John said something else. He said, I must decrease, and he must increase. He's here now. I'm just the introducer. I'm just the friend of the bridegroom. But here's that lamb we've been waiting for. Here he is. Follow him and the, the apostles got the message. I mean, John's disciples got the message. The apostles of Jesus, the 12 apostles of the Lamb, got the message. And Peter, the chief apostle, said that you, friends, were not redeemed with gold or silver or any such things, but you were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without spot and without blemish. It's a theme that runs right through the entire Bible. And in the final spectacular book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, you get, a, you get a sneak peek of heaven. Heaven right now. And John the Revelator looks and he says this, now I'm quoting Revelation 5, 6. John says, I looked and I beheld, and in the midst of the throne, and of, in the midst of the four living creatures, and of the elders, there stood a lamb as though it had been slain. There stood a lamb as though it had been slain. You know what that means? That means there's been a resurrection. There's a lamb standing with covenant marks in his body. He's been slain, but he stands. He rules. He'll break some seals off a seven-sealed scroll, and he'll begin to shake this planet. He's, a, he's beginning to shake the squatters off of his redeemed territory that he redeemed with his own blood the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That lamb slain is a lamb resurrected, and Jesus said it in John 14, 19. Because I live, you will live too. We look at that lamb as though he's been slain. We look to him with hope. We say, Jesus, how great you are, how kind you are. You defeated death on our behalf. 
Now death is not that horrible, fearful thing anymore. Now it's just a thin little vestibule to the third heaven where you behold the face, face of your Savior forever. And with him dwells the fullness of joy forever. What a Savior! What a God! Well, we know that the Passover is speaking of Jesus not just in terms of the time or the kind of animal that's being slain here, the lamb, uh, but look, at it's the place. God has chosen a place for this to happen. You see? Look at verse 2. You shall sacrifice the Passover to the Lord your God from the flock and the herd in the place where the Lord chooses to put his name. Now, we know it's going to be Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the place God has repeated himself several times throughout Kings and Chronicles. We'll get there one day. Jerusalem is where I put my name, right there. It's a, it's a special place. Uh, God t showed King David the plan, the outline, the blueprint for a temple. The temple would be the heart and uh, center of Jewish religious practice and worship. The temple, it was God's idea. And David, you know, got the materials ready and Solomon built that place. And it was all in the plan of God. Je Jesus was not against the temple. He marched into the temple uh, and he said, this is my father's house. It's a house of prayer. How dare you make it a den of thieves? See, that whole plan, that whole program there was of God. And it's in Jerusalem. One day Jerusalem will once again be the heart and center of legitimate religious worship. And we've talked about that before. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Well, you think of Jesus. Now, where was Jesus crucified? You be careful now. He wasn't crucified in Jerusalem. Well, he may say at Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the place where the sentence was handed out. He was crucified outside the gate. Jesus said it in Luke 13. Some people approached him, some Pharisees. They said, you better get out of here because Herod wants to kill you. And Jesus said, you go tell that fox that I, I will preach, I will perform cures and miracles today, tomorrow, and the third day. And then he said, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. See, Jesus was identifying himself as not, as not only a prophet, but the prophet. He is the Deuteronomy 18 prophet. He is that prophet which, which was to come into the world. He's that prophet, priest, and king. He's that priest that would be at Jerusalem and he would offer sacrifice all right. It would be his own body that he would offer. But he means that it's at Jerusalem where the Jewish Sanhedrin is functioning, and they're the people that are going to sentence to death they, who they, those who they deem worthy of it. Can we put it that way? The Jewish Sanhedrin will meet out the death, death penalty. And Jesus says, I have to go there. This has to happen to me. It can't be that a prophet perish outside Jerusalem. So he's going there to receive the, the sentence of death, but the actual crucifixion is not in Jerusalem, it's outside the gate. Uh, and you see this here in verse, look at verse 5. Deuteronomy 15, or sorry, Deuteronomy 16, verse 5. You may not sacrifice the Passover with any of your gates, which the Lord your God gives you, but at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And we read the book of Hebrews, chapter 13 and verse 12, we are told very clearly, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So technically, if you want to be precise about this, he received the death sentence inside Jerusalem, but actually paid our sin debt with his blood outside the gate. And the writer to the Hebrews goes on in the next verse and he says, let's also go out there to him. Let's bear his reproach with him. You know, people in Jerusalem in Christ's time, they hated Jesus so much, they couldn't bear the idea that he would share the planet with them. And so they sentenced him to death. A shameful, horrible death. You carry your cross outside the gate and that's where we're going to kill you. And the writer to the Hebrews says, let's follow Jesus. Let's carry our crosses out to him. Uh, let's bear his reproach. The world hated him for what he represented, what he taught, what he did. Well, let's be hated by the world for the same things. Let's not be, I mean, it's easy to have people hate you. 
you can just, just behave like a complete, you know, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being godly Christian people. Harold's laughing. <laughs> you can just be a jerk to people and have people hate you. You know, we all know people like that. No, uh, Peter talks about this. If people persecute you, uh, that's to your credit if you're, they're persecuting you for the name of Christ. You're trying to be a good person. You're speaking truth in love. You're doing good to those who need. Uh, you're, you're praying. You're loving the Lord. You're trying to be a real Christian man or woman. And the world hates you? That's fine. No problem. The world loves darkness rather than light. So the writer says, let's go out there uh, and be with him and bear his reproach. Well, look now, please, at verse 6. This is very interesting, too. You're to sacrifice the Passover at the place where God uh, tells you. Look at verse 6. At the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide, there you shall sacrifice the Passover at twilight, at the going down of the sun at the time you came out of Egypt. There is to be darkness at the time of Passover. Sun's going down. You kill the animal. Notice that Jesus hung on a cross for six hours. Three of them were shrouded in darkness. He, I mean, he, he is the one that the Passover is speaking of, very clearly. A supernatural darkness enveloped the world when Jesus hung on that cross. And we saw that. We saw that in shadow and type, if not predictive prophecy, right there in Isaiah, the 50th chapter. Remember that? Wasn't that long ago? On Good Friday, we talked about that at the going down of the sun. Matthew 27 and 45 says, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the whole land. And Jesus is trying to get our attention here. And he cries out that 22nd Psalm, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Directing his, his hearers to that crucifixion psalm. You know, he's the one who, that the psalm is speaking of. And the darkness that envelopes the land makes it clear once again that He's the one that the Passover was pointing to. Jesus, in his dying breaths, is directing people to the Old Testament to find testimony there of him. You know, during his earthly ministry, he was, he was saying that. Everything written about me must be fulfilled. All the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, they all speak of me. Even as he is dying for the sins of the world, he's still preaching that message. And that's why, friends, we don't just set aside the Old Testament. We don't just throw the Old Testament away. We don't just throw the Mosaic Law away. It's, it's, it's telling us about Jesus. It's painting a beautiful picture of him. We're seeing something about the magnificence, the brilliance, the love, the mercy, the omnipotence of God right there in the scriptural testimony to Jesus. See? And I just can't help but get excited about this. I hope you do too. It's beautiful. It's magnificent. Well, of course, now, uh, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is all just one thing. There's two aspects to this. There's, of course, the Passover and the Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, seven days, no leaven in your homes. But really, it's, it's under one umbrella thing. I mean, this is, this is the Passover time we're talking about. And, of course, leaven, or the yeast that goes into the dough, that rising agent... That is a symbol often in the Bible of sin. Jesus talked about the leaven of the Pharisees. He said, you, you disciples, now you beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the Bible says in Luke 12, 1, the leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. You claim to be one thing, but you're really something else. You, hypocrisy, hypocrite, you are a play actor. You're a guy wearing a mask. That's what Jesus could tell those Pharisees. You hypocrites. But at Matthew 23, he really lays into them in Matthew 23. And Matthew 12, you are hypocrites. You look good on the outside, but you are full of dead man's bones on the inside. You need to cleanse what's inside. And guess what? Only God can do that. You need to come to God for cleansing. But it comes out as hypocrisy, see? And in Matthew 16 and verse 12, he says that the, the leaven of the Pharisees is false doctrine. And I don't know about you, but I kind of see a progression there, don't you? You start off, maybe you're teaching the right things, but inside you're a total hypocrite. I mean, inside you're just full of 
hatred and wrath and unbelief, and for whatever reason you're preaching the gospel, maybe because it makes you rich or popular or well-liked or something, but inside you have no love for God. So you're a hypocrite. That's, you're, you've got the leaven of the Pharisees going on in your life. But you want to know something? You can't keep that up. I don't think it's possible. If you're living like that, it's only a matter of time before it starts to become reflected in the things you teach. And I said it before, friends, I mean it. Doctrinal heresy has a moral foundation. You start off hating God, and next thing you know, you're going to start warping and twisting his scriptural truth. His doctrines start to become compromised. Of course, because you don't like getting convicted regularly by God's word, and so you just tweak it a little bit or omit certain things. And before long, it's total doctrinal heresy. It's false doctrine. And I think Jesus would want us to be very careful about this. I mean, how many times does the Lord have to say, beware, don't be deceived, watch out for false teachers, false apostles, watch out, watch out. You know, the Bible doesn't multiply references to those things because they're just so easy to spot. It multiplies references to these things because they're not easy. Sometimes they're not obvious. You've got to test all things. Now, what are you going to test things with, friends? What on earth can you test doctrine with? Anyone know? It's going to be the Bible. Yeah, God's Word. That's the rock-solid plumb line. It's irrevisible. It doesn't ever need to be corrected. It's declared. It's eternal in the heavens. It's inscripturated in the Bible, and you measure everything against what God has said in Scripture. And then you'll be able to pick out the phonies. Then you'll be able to spot things. Won't be that hard. Know the truth. You'll spot the phonies. You know, people that work in, uh, at the Mint, in places like that, dealing with money, uh, bankers, bank tellers, and so on, uh, they need to be trained. They need to be trained to spot counterfeit money. You know how they're trained to do that? They're trained to become experts in what real money looks like. This is what a real $20 bill looks like. Look at that diagnostic feature right there. Look at that thing right there. Feel the money. See it? Feel the texture and so on? You know what real money looks like? Counterfeits are easy to spot. You know what the Bible says? You'll spot false doctrine. The leaven of the Pharisees, you won't let it into your home. See? And that's important. It's very, very important. Uh, that leaven, it's a, it's a picture of sin, and God says, get it out of your house. Get it out of your life. Get it out of your mind. Because it'll, it'll kill. It really will. Of course, now, the antithesis to all this is the unleavened bread that they were to eat. Sweep your homes clean of leaven. We don't want one speck of it, but make bread anyhow, and it'll be unleavened bread. Uh, and of course, that, I mean, that's obvious. This is speaking of Jesus Christ, the Lord. He is the broken bread. Pure, holy, not a speck of sin in Jesus. Not one wrong thought, action, word, deed, completely, holy, pure. Jesus. In fact, impeccable. He is impeccable. That's the theological word. He couldn't sin. It's not even possible that Jesus could sin because he's God. He has that eternal divine nature. And so we see him as the bread of life, that unleavened bread. Now, turn please, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going we're gonna to breathe a sigh of relief. Now we know we've interpreted this correctly. Because Paul's going to help us here. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You have it there, 1 Corinthians 5. And of course, now Paul, this is, we've just fast-forwarded 1,400 years, right? I mean, just a minute ago, we were with Moses, as Moses gives instructions once again regarding Passover. As we flip ahead in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 5, it's like we've jumped, jumped into the time machine and we've zipped ahead uh, 1,400 years, uh, even past the crucifixion resurrection, and we stopped the machine something like uh, 20 years after the resurrection. 
something like that. We're at, we're at about 55 AD now, Paul is writing this stuff to the Corinthians. A very dysfunctional church, by the way, who needs some serious instruction. And here's part of the instruction that Paul has for those believers. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Your glorying is not good. He's talking about uh, tolerating sin in their midst. He says, You're, don't glory in this. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the leaven that you may be a new lump, since, truly, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Well, that's very, I mean, that's as powerful as you want to make it. What kind of instructions are we getting here? Paul wants us to know that he has both the entire church, the local assembly in mind, and he has individual believers in mind. Uh, when he says, purge out that leaven so that you may be a new lump, he is speaking of the church, the assembly, and individual Christians in their own lives. We need to have a zero tolerance for sin. And we've talked about this before. You don't want one single solitary speck of that stuff in your life. You don't want sin in your life. Sin is like leaven. It grows. It affects things. It doesn't just affect you. Uh, you cannot think that you're going to have the secret sin. See, I just do this secret thing here. No one knows about this one. Uh, and that won't, affect any, that won't affect how I operate in the world. It won't affect my relationships. Uh, it'll, just, it'll just be me. I, only I'm the one who knows this. Maybe God knows but I can function just fine. You want to know something? No, that, that will not happen. We're going to get to the book of Joshua one day, <laughs> and we're going to hear about the sin of Achan. Nobody knew what he did. Only him and God knew. You know what that was? It, that was a complete disaster for the nation. And God is trying to let us know something. There are no secret sins. Friends, he knows about them, and... Uh, under God, that sin is going to spread and there will, be a, there will be causal relationships. I guarantee it. It will affect things adversely. Can I put it mildly like that? You won't act the same as you would have had you not sinned. Something going on in your spirit when you sin. I need to say this. The church needs to hear it. It's important. I don't have anyone in mind. You know, if you're sitting there thinking, oh man, he's talking about me right now. Okay, I'm glad you're thinking that and, and you're going to do what you need to do. But honesty, under God, I'm not thinking about anybody. I just feel God wants me to say this. Someone needs to hear it. S sin spreads. It influences things. It affects things. It affects you. It affects your demeanor. It affects the words you say, the thoughts you think, the actions you take. Uh, and it creates ripple effects that are not good. No secret sins. Zero tolerance for sin. It's like that leaven. Sweep your homes clean of leaven. None in the bread. None in your home. No sin in your life. False doctrine, that's leaven. Right? I think false doctrine is like the, one of the last dominoes to fall. I think hypocrisy and uh, a heart position that's not right, if, that's not, if that goes unchecked, it will, uh, it will influence the doctrine you teach. Uh, and that's like the last domino, and then it, you're just influencing everybody with, with, with falsehood and corruption. But listen to what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy, the second chapter. He says, I need you to shun vain and profane babblings, or idle babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their message will spread like a cancer. Uh, there's a reason why God has zero tolerance for sin, because it does spread like leaven. It does influence things. It wrecks things. Uh, it makes things disastrous, you know. And, um, and God can deal with that. You can recover from that. You can be made right with God again. God can restore to you the joy of your salvation. You can pick up and get going again. God doesn't want you crippled with uh, regret and guilt. He doesn't want that for you. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, wh why even have to pass through all that? Why, why do you want to pass through 
this dark time where, where you're confessing these horrible things you did or thought. You know, you don't want to pass through that time. Don't you just want to walk strong with God one foot in front of the other and not have any regrets at all? I do, because I have enough already. I have mountains of regret. Let's not add to these things, okay? Uh, but notice now, please, uh, verse 7. Paul says, Purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Uh, we're learning something here about human responsibility. Purge out that leaven. You know, in context, he's talking about uh, sin in the church. You got a guy in your church, he's sinning with a high hand. He's leading an immoral lifestyle, wretched, abominable to God, and nobody's doing anything about this. In fact, you're kind of almost applauding what he's doing. Paul says, get that out from your congregation. And... Um, those of you who are like official members of the church, you've taken the, um, the, the church membership orientation class where we have to touch on it. If there are people in this church sinning against God openly, against him with, like, as I say, with a high hand, and they're rejoicing in their sin, and they're promoting their sin, and, it's a, and we know that it's abominable to God, it's in the Bible, um, I'm just going to have to talk to you about that. And if there's no repentance, I have to show you the door which I hope I never, ever have to do. I sure do. That's the last thing I want to do. But we are going to purge out that old leaven from our own hearts, minds, lives, homes, from the church. Because we want something that's powerful and effective and a clean vessel that God can use. God doesn't require um, per perfect vessels right now. That, that much is clear. He uses people to do his work. Guess what? He has just chosen to use imperfection. Praise the Lord. But the vessel needs to be clean, at least clean. So no secret sins. Pur and he says, you need to do this. You purge out the leaven. Uh, Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 7, Timothy, exercise yourself unto godliness. Uh, in this passage, I really like the New, New International Version. Train yourself to be godly. Train yourself. That's human responsibility here. Yes, we know God works in the heart and the Holy Spirit ministers to our minds, and yet you have responsibility. Train yourself. Don't look at garbage on the internet. Don't look at garbage on TV. Uh, do your best to uh, think about good things, and God is going to show you where to draw the line there. You know, Paul tells you in, in uh, Philippians, the fourth chapter, if there be... Uh, you know, think of things with, of good report. If there's anything praiseworthy, if anything noble or good or, you know, commendable, you can think about those things. And I think I've shared this before. I mean, I like, I think valor and heroics and I think self-sacrifice and bravery, those are all commendable things. And I like watching that on film, so I like, often I like war movies. If the violence isn't gratuitous, if it isn't just unnecessary violence, right? Um, but you need to know under God, where you're going to draw the line. What form of entertainment do you say is acceptable, and which do you say, no way, I'm not looking at that? In, in these ways, you train yourself to be godly. See? Purge out that, that old leaven. And then lastly, look at verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Well, when we think about keeping the feast, um, we're thinking about, of course, the Lord's Supper, which we do monthly here, the Lord's, feet, uh, the Lord's table, the breaking of the unleavened bread together, and we drink uh, of the juice of the fruit of the vine. Uh, and we're trying to keep close to our hearts and minds all that the Lord's Supper symbolizes and represents. Uh, we're thinking about what the Lord did for us and that we are to feast on Jesus it, spiritually. We, we eat his, his body and we drink his blood. We're thinking spiritually now. B Jesus uses those metaphors, doesn't he? The perfect body and blood of Jesus gives us spiritual life. And, in fact, uh, eternal life with glorified physical bodies yet in the future. And we're supposed to keep that feast without that old leaven in our lives without malice, without wickedness, but with sincerity and truth. So moment by moment, 
feasting on Jesus. By what? By believing in him and coming to him. That's what he said in John 6. He said, that's what I mean by eating and drinking, you know, my flesh and my blood. You come to me, you believe in me, and you trust in me for eternal life. Moment by moment, feasting on Jesus with sincerity and truth, especially as we gather together for the communion table. And what God wants out of all this is a loving Christian community which will be a suitable picture of the loving community that ex has existed in the Trinity. We're a reflection of a, of a divine relationship that's been going on from all eternity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit in love relationship. No malice there, no wickedness there, just sincerity, love, and truth to be reflected in your life and in mine, in our homes, in the church, wherever we go. That is a picture of the Trinity and something else, friends. It's a witness to a fallen world too. And Jesus said it in John 13, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have what? Love one to another. So we keep the feast, not with malice and wickedness, but with sincerity and truth. In that way, we are divine, so to speak, reflectors of divine love, relationship, truth, revelation, and yet a testimony to an unbelieving world. The way we conduct ourselves here, the way we relate to each other, a beautiful picture, a beautiful picture of true disciples of Christ. We are, friends, the only Bible some people have right now. And everything we've been seeing here in the Bible speaks of Jesus. And everything we say, do, and think in the world is to speak of Jesus to the world out there that needs his revelation. Okay? Well, friends, I mean, that's a lot. We just covered a lot of territory here uh, in the Bible. I think I'd just like to pray and ask the Lord to seal these truths uh, into our hearts deeply so that we can reflect these beautiful, divine realities. Let's ask God for some help here this morning. Loving God and Father, we come now to the throne of grace. And uh, Lord, our minds right now seem to be jam-packed with information and overflowing. And we've seen something of your wonderful wisdom, power, omnipotence, in that you've uh, ordained whatsoever comes to pass, wonderful prophecies concerning the coming of Jesus, fulfilled to the letter and in spectacular fashion when he did come into the world. We think, Lord, about the supernatural brilliance to ordain the Passover meal and all the little details that attend that meal, all of which point us to our Savior, our blessed Savior, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. And Lord, we're in awe of how great you are in these things, and yet uh, we do feel a deep conviction when we think about the zero tolerance for sin that we should be having in our lives. And we ask you, God, for your help. We ask for forgiveness for the times when, when uh, we allowed things into our lives that didn't belong there, things that you were not pleased to have there. We ask forgiveness, God, and we trust you that you will grant it. And your word tells us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive sin and to cleanse from all unrighteousness. We praise and thank you for these, this wonderful promise, God. And we ask you now as we go forward that you would equip us with the requisite strength and wisdom and discernment to keep that which is displeasing to you out of our lives, out of our minds, out of our homes, out of our church. We ask it, God, so that we would be clean vessels, so that this church would be a clean vessel in your hand, an instrument that you can use to reach the world, to expose darkness, and to call people into your marvelous light. Thank you, O oh God, that you hear prayer and you answer prayer, and that you have answered prayer. We praise God. We praise and honor you today. And we thank you for all that you did, are doing, and yet will do on planet Earth. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. We praise the Lord. May God bless you all.